fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, solar flares. The news is full of a lot of dangers. And reading about these things is very easy to give rise to a sense of fear, anxiety. And sometimes they come close. Like here in California, fires and earthquakes are very close. But we have to remember that dangers like this are not new. That chant just now, or subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, or as the Thais translate the phrase, aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal. These things have been with us all along, and sometimes it's not the big things we die from. You hear about people dying from paper cuts, people dying from a little bit of coagulated blood getting in the bloodstream and getting the wanderlust and moving around and getting lodged in your heart, lodged in your brain. There are dangers on all sides, and they always have been. The trick is knowing what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of. And death is one of those things we shouldn't be afraid of. Remember when I was staying with the John Fuhr? There was one time when he asked me sort of incredulously, the way you'd ask a child who should have outgrown childish things, are you still afraid of death? And in most parts of the world, the obvious answer would be yes, but in that society it was something to be ashamed of. Death is going to happen regardless. But our fear of death can make us do things that are even worse than death. That's what we should be afraid of. There's a kind of fear that the Buddha said actually is skillful, that there's the fear of heedfulness, there's the fear of compunction. Compunction is the potapa in Pali. It means that fear that you see, if I do something unskillful, the results are going to be bad. And so you're not apathetic. You want to be very careful about your actions. And the same with heedfulness. The two concepts are very close. You realize that the difference between danger and safety can lie in your actions. So you want to be very careful about what you do. Pay careful attention to what you're doing. This is why you want to move beyond just good intentions to skillful intentions. The fears you have to watch out for, well, fear of death is number one, because that kind of fear becomes the fear of what they call the akati, the four biases that can take you off course. That fear of, fear of various things. We do things that are really unskillful. And that's what we should be afraid of, the unskillful things. Because those things will have an impact for a long time to come. This is a passage where the Buddha says there are four reasons why we fear death. One is fear of losing the body. We don't know what we're going to do without this body we've been with so long. Fear of losing the central pleasures we've enjoyed here in life. Fear of thinking about some of the unskillful things we've done, harsh things, cruel things to other people, other beings. The fear that maybe we're going to be punished for that after death. And then finally there's the fear that comes from just not having seen the true Dharma. In other words, not knowing that there is something deathless in the mind. These are the fears we have to overcome. And whatever is needed to overcome these fears is really valuable. Whatever sacrifices need to be made as we develop this practice so we're not attached to the body, so we're not attached to our sensual pleasures, so we can look back on our life and realize we haven't done anything cruel. And so we ultimately get to the point where we have seen the deathless inside. That gives us that our guarantee that death is not annihilation. And the fact of death itself is not the thing to be feared. It's your unskillful actions that get in the way of getting beyond suffering. Those are the things to be feared. 
So this is one of the reasons why we meditate, why we practice. The contemplation of the body is there to see that the body is here to be used. In and of itself, there's nothing much. But as a tool for the practice, it's, it's very useful. But you don't want to get lust over the body or pride over the body to get in the way. The same with sensual pleasures. We develop a sense of well-being with the breath, what the Buddha calls the pleasure of form, as we're doing right now. Focusing on the breath, coming in, going out, trying to make the breath comfortable. And once there is a sense of ease with the breath, allowing that to spread. So the body is suffused with a sense of good energy. As we taste this pleasure, we realize that the pleasures of sights, sounds, tastes, smells, tactile sensations are not nearly as deep, not nearly as valuable. And having this alternative pleasure helps pull us away or gives, gives us an alternative where we can step back from our desire for sensual pleasures. And also from the things we do to gain those sensual pleasures, some of which are okay and other which are, others of which are not. As the Buddha once said, if you don't have this kind of pleasure inside, then no matter how much you may understand the drawbacks of sensuality, you're still going to go back for sensual pleasures, because you don't see that there's any other alternative to pain. Here the Buddha is giving you an alternative, and it's based on this alternative that we can see the true Dharma. In other words, see that there really is something deathless inside. When you've stripped away your attachments to things outside of the concentration, and then you turn around and look at the concentration itself, and see that th this too is fabricated, this too is marked by some, even no matter how much subtle it may be, it is marked by stress. And there must be something better. And you learn how to let go of it in a way that you're not going back to your old unconcentrated ways. That's when you see there's something inside that really is valuable, that can't be touched by fires or earthquakes or solar flares. That's when you're safe. That's when you're reliable. Up to that point, you can practice concentration some, you can practice the precepts some, but it's not all that reliable. There's still the temptation, say, when things get difficult. You have, might ask yourself, you know, if society really does break down, can you trust yourself not to steal, not to kill, even when you're really hungry and when you're really deprived? And if you can't trust yourself in that way, you, that's something to be scared of. That's the that's the fear of compunction. That's the fear of heedfulness. And that's a skillful fear. That should motivate you to want to look deeper into your practice and be willing to make whatever sacrifices are necessary. All too often we want to design our path to nirvana. It's going to have to have this kind of food. It's going to have to have this kind of community. It's going to have to have this kind, these kinds of surroundings. And if you're not willing to give up those attachments, you're never going to get there, because they will hold priority over the need to get past the, the possibility in the mind that you could turn around and start doing unskillful things again. The pursuit of the deathless requires that you give up a lot. A lot of times it's things that you really like, things that you not only just like, but you feel that you are entitled to. But you think about the Buddha himself, as he said when he realized that to get the mind in concentration he was going to have to give up sensual pleasures, to get the mind deeper 
he was going to have to give up the pleasures of concentration. His mind never leaped up at the idea that he'd have to give these things up. It required that he reason with himself to point out the drawbacks of remaining attached. And then he'd finally be willing. So it doesn't come easy. We have to give up a lot. And it's learning how not to be afraid of giving up a lot. That's what's going to get us to advance on the path. So we start out with fear of losing our things, and we realize that the thing, a lot of things we're afraid of losing are things we will have to give up anyhow. So the question is, are you going to give it up in a way where they're just stripped from your grasp or because you've seen that there's a good trade? It's wiser to make the trade so that you have something to show for it. In other words, if these things get stripped away from you at death, there's nothing to show for it. There's no virtue in letting go at that point. But if you let go while you have, still have the opportunity to hold on, but you realize, okay, I don't have to hold on to these things. There's a reward in that. It's a trade. As one of the Buddhist disciples says, I'll, I'll trade attachment for the deathless, aging for the aging, unaging. Now, those are things we have to give up. So don't be afraid of giving up things. Be more afraid of the fact that if you don't know how to give up, you can't trust yourself. Try to encourage the fear of heedfulness and the fear of compunction. So you can get past the fear of the what they call the akati, the biases that would pull you off course. So it's a question of learning which fears are skillful and which ones are not. Sometimes letting go of things that you would be afraid to let go of. But the payoff can be really great. So this practice of getting the mind still, so you can look at these things with more balance. If there's no sense of well-being inside, it's very hard to make a wise decision. We're driven by our hungers. It's like the scientists who cheat on their experiments because they're hungry for fame. If you're not hungry for fame, you simply want to find the truth. You're a lot more reliable. The same way if you have this sense of well-being inside. You see that some of the ways the mind reasons with itself, I've got to hold on to this, can't let go. You can see how petty they are and how self-serving. So give time to the mind to develop this fortress inside, this, this strong what John Munn would call our, our, our place of victory. The mind that's well settled inside has a good sense of well-being inside from its concentration. We can look at the rest of your life in all fairness. Get a better sense of what's really worthy of fear and what's not. 